the John read. Um, the Bible's upside down, so it's as, it's as organized as me, and I'm shaking like a leaf, and I don't have a clue um, where I'm going to start. Um, but I'd just like to start by saying um, it's almost been a year since we've come to Shiloh. Um, I think it was December last year. I've only got two pages, and they're all messed up already. But um, it was December last year um, since uh, we came to Shiloh, and I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Too many people um, to name. For um, It's been great for us, and we'll come here for the Word, and we really enjoy the Word. Um, the church we used to go to, uh, Carter was very hard, you know, he would kick back on the wheelchair and he didn't want to come in the door but we'll, get him, we'll keep him in church now until Taddy starts to speak and then we'll take him out <laughs> so, <laughs> just so everybody else can hear but from day one um, we felt the presence of the Lord here and that was very important because when we, we felt it was time to move on from Nocknagoni and I talked with Mr McElveen he said that's okay you know, just as long as you're not leaving the Lord's presence um, behind. But I want to read just a few verses from two different Psalms. But in Psalm 34, um, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked on to him, and were lightened. Their faces were not ashamed. And then verse 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. And then just one other verse. It's the verse that has meant a lot, a lot. Um to me for three years coming up now in October but it's Psalm 51 verse 17 the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart O God you will not despise I'm going to ask the Lord um, for help we're going to pray and and seek the Lord's face and see if it can stop me shaking <laughs> um, like a leaf uh, Father we're thankful for your goodness uh, to us uh, we well, thank you for Jesus because in him was life uh, and that life was the light of men. And I pray now, Lord, you would uh, take away the nerves, take over. Uh, I ask you for um, the Holy Spirit. Um, without you, we can do nothing. And I pray, Lord, now that you'd be pleased to back um, what I have prepared and what I will say back at home with, with full time power. And I ask you, Lord, if there's someone here struggling uh, or someone who's not saved, that even tonight they would come to know him, him to know as life eternal, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, the psalm is a great psalm of restoration. Uh, it tells me that there's a way back to God. And um, three years ago, or four years ago, um, I was in a bad, uh, a bad place, and this psalm, as you'll realise as we go on and a wee bit, um, but it becomes very important to me. But um, I was born in a little place called Portavogie. It's the most easterly point in the whole island of Ireland. That's our claim to fame. But um, that's where I was born. And I was born in Ard's Hospital. And I was only born there because there was no Stephen Farry or anyone in those days to close it down. So I was born there in 1978. And... Um, my mum, I'm not sure if she's here tonight or not, um, she said she was coming, but uh, uh, my mum was young when I was born, and her and my father, they got married young. But most of my childhood, um, I was sent to live, or lived with my grandparents, and they were very good to me, and I lapped it up. And, um, but um, my father died when I was, when, when my father died young with a massive heart attack. Um, my mum, um, she's been saved from a young age and she's involved with the children's ministry in her local church. Um, my father was um, a good man. He was very smart and uh, he could turn his hand to almost anything. But um, sadly too, he was also a- an alcoholic. And um, without taking away anything from his memory, I say that, but um, later in life, he did give his life to the Lord. And sometimes 
I wish he was still here um, for the children today uh, because they would, they would love that. Um, my grandmother was a saved lady and she was very faithful, not only faithful in attending the house of God, but she was also um, a very faithful um, Christian lady. You know, she would sit at night and she had a wee Bible and the companion for the Bible was a wee hymn book and she would have a hymn for every verse and you wouldn't get past her, you know, without, um, without getting something um, from her. Um, well, I was sent along to the local Presbyterian church where our family worshipped. Um, went there every Sunday. Monday night was Christian Endeavour. Tuesday night was the Boys Brigade. Wednesday night was the Midweek Meeting. Thursday night was the Girls Brigade. I didn't have to go to that one, but maybe that would be different <laughs> today. Um, Friday night was the Youth Focus. And if you think that wasn't bad enough, on a Sunday afternoon, the man stopped, you know, in a big car, and uh, we were all piled in, and we had to go to the Gospel Hall Sunday School in the afternoon. Um, so uh, our family minister was called um, the Reverend Ivan Neese, and I'm still friendly with Mr. Neese today, and sometimes he would call even and see us. And, um, but we always were told that if we wanted to go to heaven, that we needed to be born again. We're going to have to take a wee drink just for... Um, I left school whenever I was 16, and um, like my father and grandfather, um, I wanted to be a fisherman. Now, um, my birthday fell in September, and so I had to do another school year, but I hated school. And I got off the school bus on my, the 8th of September on my 16th birthday, and I lit a cigarette. You know, as the bus pulled away, and just had to walk across the road into the house, you know. And, and uh, they said, I'm a... If you're going to smoke, you're not be living here. So the cigarette was was quickly extinguished. But um, I headed off to see them. Um, the the boat I worked on was called the Fragrant Rose, and my first week's wages at 16 um, was 870 pounds, and that was quite a wee bit of money back then in the, the mid 1990s. Um, with the money came the way of the world. You know, fast cars, um, drink, drugs, uh, like you know, like party drugs and all. Um, um, before long I was in the fig of it and wasn't long before I was caught up in a web of sin. I'm not exactly sure of the year from all by myself here, but um, about 2001, maybe tightly roughly, um, I was going to a nightclub in Bangor and there was two men giving out um, gospel literature and uh, I met Taddy and Taddy gave me his book and then the next thing... <laughs> um, well, the next thing was running about with the, the likes of Johnny Adair and Stevie Top Gun <laughs> McKeague. Sorry, Taffy. <laughs> no, but, um, this was after Taffy's book. <laughs> um, <laughs> he signed it too. <laughs> but um, in all seriousness, um, I left the nightclub early that night and I went home. And I can still see the calendar on, on the wall of our house. And the, the calendar said, um, probably come from the Gospel Hall. The one I didn't, the Sunday school I didn't like, for it was more strict, you know. But um, it said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Um, um, that night I asked the Lord to forgive me, and I went on with a while for God. I, w- that, I went on a while with God, but um, sadly I fell away, and I went deeper into the things of the world. And it's true what they say. You know, sometimes I get discouraged by others. I'm sure nearly everybody here has been discouraged or hurt by maybe another Christian or, or, or somebody else. But, but to be fair, it's hard for a Christian to hear God through a closed Bible. And, and I went the way back into the world, um, far worse than ever before. Um, September 2013, was that like 11, 11 years ago roughly now, um, uh, a routine fishing trip, and um, I was doing quite well. Um, my crewmate, he was away on, in Australia on holiday, and uh, as I headed back for home for Portofogie, um, I had a problem, and uh, there was some water inside the boat, and that very quickly got worse, and I had all three different bilge pumps going, and I realised that um, I have a problem. Well, the two problems really, one, the water, and two, I didn't carry a life raft. And... Uh, always had this ideology in my head, you know, if anything ever happens, I can lie with my feet up and read a newspaper. You didn't have Twitter in those days. And 
I'm waiting on somebody coming to rescue me. But um, as things very quickly got worse, and uh, a storm came southwest five to seven, and um, so I called Belfast Coast Guard uh, to tell them I had a pan pan, which was like an like an emergency, and um, was I called the Coast Guard and, and told them this. He told me to change channel, and I'm sort of getting into a panic now. And uh, as I slowed the boat down, the the boat went down and it just rolled over leaving me trapped inside and I had a wee life jacket on. Uh, for over an hour then I scrambled the waves doing the doggy paddle and, and after that I got to go to London for doing the doggy paddle but I got to the, the Barbican, it was quite embarrassing really but um, uh, but I couldn't see anything you know and um, I had to fight for my life and I felt like I'd been there for maybe eight or nine hours and it's, it's getting dark now. And uh, the wee life jacket, that was going down like a balloon, you know, with a leak on it. And I was scared to touch it to try to blow it up or do anything in case it made the situation any worse. But, you know, the water was um, starting now to, to get the better off me and I was swallowing it and there was diesel and I was starting to get sick. And um, Belfast Coast Guard here in Bangor, they started to coordinate um, a search and rescue operation to retrieve me. Um, there was, the message was being relayed, but um, they had gone to the wrong position. And uh, the point came to, for me where um, I could uh, no more strength, and uh, was too tired. And um, you know, I was trying to like, do the doggy paddle west all the time, and the tide was taking me away up the North Channel. And uh, so I turned my back finally to the, the waves, and the big waves were going over my head, and I was choking on the vomit, and. Uh, and uh, so I let myself go and uh, all I could think was that in a minute or two I'm going to stand before God and I'm not ready for that one um, Hebrews 9 27 it's appointed unto man once to die but after this the judgment and uh, started to think silly things you know like who's going to feed my dog and uh, you know, you know like silly things like that um, and uh, and then, you know, I was getting worse and worse, and then I started to lose um, consciousness, and I was injured as well. Um, but as I was dying, um, I prayed uh, the first time in, in a long time, and I'm sure you've done it too. You use prayer as a 999, and like maybe have a busy day, and you don't pray as much as you should or not at all, and then you remember, I never prayed that. Or, but use prayer as a 999, and... Lord, get me out of this one. I know I've done it now, but I promise you this, and I promise you that, and I'll do this, and I'll do that, and all. Um, I wonder, did anybody know? Did anybody even know that, that what had happened? You know, uh, um, Psalm 130, verse 1 says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, or unto you, O Lord. And um, Belfast Coast Guard, unknown to me, had requested the launch of Rescue 116, um, helicopter from Dublin and they had worked out the, with the tidal pattern and the, the direction of the wind um, you know where to start searching for me um, there's a, a big Russian tank, tanker passing by and uh, the, the captain had seen diesel in the water because I'd filled the tanks that morning so he gave the Coast Guard the, the position so when um, the Port of Ferry inshore lifeboat headed there and Donaghadee lifeboat was coming the other way um, when Port of Ferry lifeboat arrived to me, um, no one would come in to retrieve my body. So um, the, the guy Marco, who was a coxswain or a captain, he unclipped himself from the helm and he came in and retrieved my body. And the RNLI sacked him for it because he wasn't meant to, to leave his position. But when we got to the Barbican, he, he got reinstated um, after that. Um, and soon after, I was on the deck of the, the lifeboat and they gave me first aid. And then I was transferred to the Rescue 116 helicopter, which took me to Musgrave Hospital. And then I was transferred to the Royal um, by ambulance. And just to note, um, the people in the 116 helicopter who, who rescued me, um, not long after that, they died. Um, they hit an island off the west coast of Ireland, uh, killing all four crew on board. Um, things for me soon returned to normal. But I forgot about my deal with God. 
Ecclesiastes 5 verse 4 says, Without that that you have vowed unto God. So it's dangerous not to keep a promise uh, to the Lord. Um, sin would take me further still. Um, sort of became a target for the, the PSNI and it was viewed by some officers and probably still today. Um, there was a, a heroin problem and there was needles and, and drugs and stuff like that and they were found in the play parks. You know, people were being mugged and, um, and I spoke out against it. But um, I was arrested many times. Um, I was even held and I was transferred to Scotland by it was a Group 4 security company for doing 37 mile an hour in a 30 in Stranraer seven, like, um, seven years prior. It said on the ticket to hand your licence in the Newton Arch and I'd done that. So I had to, they kept me in Musgrave for five days and then I was transferred to Scotland and then it was free out of court because I'd done what it said, uh, what it said on the ticket. Um, another time um, the weather was bad so we took the boat into Whitehaven and um, that night um, five pubs were wrecked and everybody was arrested but they, they didn't let me out um, I had to stay in a, in a wee police station until the police came from Lisburn to take me to Musgrave um, and I had to address warrants that were a load of nonsense and something I had no part in because it hadn't even been in the country when they took place so I've always had a, a bit of friction uh, with the, the PSNI um, Carter you know, I'm sure you hear Carter. If you don't know him, you'll hear him. Um, Carter was born in 2017. By this time, I was on cocaine most weekends. You know, sometimes I'd maybe put an ounce of cocaine in me on a Friday night. Carter would be getting up, or, or, and the kids, you know, in the, in the morning time, I'd be just going to bed. And I'm telling you, I could hoover it. And uh, that was 2017. Um, I'm sure as you know, you hear Carter here, um, he's a great wee boy, and um, you know, just over a year ago, Carter had to have his, his hair shaved. We couldn't get him in the door of a church, couldn't get him to bed, couldn't, we, couldn't, um, we found it very hard. No matter what we tried, we couldn't get anywhere. But Taddy told me to start putting my hand on his head, you know, when I was praying with him. And if you look now, he's got really long hair, and he's happy, and he's doing well. And th the song we sang last year, Jesus loves me, he can hum it. He can't speak, but he can hum it. Um, disabled. Disabled means like, uh, like um, not able, you know, and, but he's very able because I had to put a big six foot fence up between me and my neighbour. For the neighbour came one day, he climbed over the fence and stole their dinner and came back, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, he's, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's, um, He's a lot, he's, he's nothing to learn, but um, I was reading not so long ago in the book of Acts that um, the apostles were coming and they left the sick and, and disabled people out on the street so their shadow w would heal them, but it wasn't the shadow that healed them, it was faith. And he's come a long way and he'll come a long way more because I believe that um, God's doing something and I'll never give up on him. Uh, 2020, sorry, hold on, I've missed a wee bit here on my two pages. Um, so, uh, Carter was born then in 2017, Lily 2018, Caleb 2018, Lily 2019. And um, I wasn't the man for them, the dad that I should have been. Um, sometimes I'd be away at sea for 21 days on guardship. Um, I remember this is where everything spiritually kind of began for me. I was 270 miles northeast of Fraserburgh, and I was in a, for, a Force 10 gale, and uh, it was the biggest boat I had ever skippered, and I was the only one really that spoke English, you know, and the two, uh, two engineers, but we had a problem, and we were trying to go to a place called Balta, and Balta is the most northerly point of the whole UK, and I, someone from Puerto Vogue probably never been there, including me, you know, and... Um, but we got the problem patched up and we were heading in that night and I was told not to attempt the passage at dark and uh, but I wanted to shore, you know I'd had enough of the weather and it was bad but uh, a man I hadn't spoke to or seen for a long time but um, he was a paramilitary and he had got saved but he sent me a bible verse and I cannot remember the bible verse just right now, it's one out of my head but he sent me a bible verse 
And this is, this is where I started to think about God. So in 2020, I tried everything I could, like, like this, you know, to bridge the gap between you and God. And I couldn't do it. So we came across someone on Facebook I hadn't seen for, for more than 20 years. It was Taddy. And uh, when I came, I came across Taddy, I told Taddy the truth. Um, my life has descended into chaos and I'm caught up in a web of sin. Um, there's an old song that my granny used to sing, but it's, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? And that was like my life. But Taddy didn't miss me. He told me, you know what Taddy's like? Laura said to me there one day, um, Taddy's a good listener. And I said to Taddy, and he said, it depends who you are. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, when, <laughs> when, when I told Taddy, when I spoke to Taddy, and I think it was 2020, and he told me to repent. And he also said, start going to church quietly. And I'd done that on a Sunday morning, and one or two people, you know, knew me. And all I wanted was for somebody to come, to come to me and open up the Bible and show me, and show me, you know, uh, show me how you can get right with God. Show me there's a way back. But um, for me, that didn't happen. Um, that's why we come to Shadow because everybody I see it comes in that door. They're always made um, very welcome. But after I spoke to Taddy and I started going to a church that were probably horrified that someone like me attend it. Um, I came across a, a thing on YouTube, and I still watch this even today, but it was by a, an old pastor called Pastor Jim McConnell, and the thing is called Broken Things. And I knew I was a broken thing. Nobody had to tell me that. And most days my kids break something, and I have to go and, and get the toolkit. But um, what the old pastor said was bang on. Um, and I found out after that, that that he had passed away and was promoted to glory. But what he said, it spoke to me. Uh, he had long left this scene of time. But what he said was, God delights in broken things. He takes them and he breaks them and he blesses them and he uses them for his glory. Um, in October, the end of that year, 2021, um, another man who's a friend called Derek, and Derek's an elder in his church. And uh, I'll just stop and tell you something now. But um, I always went to church casually dressed. And, and one day I got a suit. I think I, I sent you a picture of the suit. But a man in the church, not Derek, but a man said to me, Have you any suit, boy? You know, and I said no. <laughs> so here uh, I was in Belfast and I was walking past a charity shop. It was Bernardo's or Oxfam. And there was this lovely pinstripe suit. And here it fitted me perfectly. And, uh, and the boy gave me it like for a fiver and I got a shirt and tie. And, um, and I spent so much time, I had it perfect in the shirt and the tie. And I went and got shoes. And I went into church that Sunday morning. And it was quite busy. And I came right up to the front and I sat here. And I was all chuffed. I had to sit new. And, and then whenever I got home and I took my jacket off, there was a big tag about that size. It said Oxfam on it. So that was, uh, that was the end of the suit. So <laughs> never ever again did I wear the suit. <laughs> In fact, um, in fact, in Hollywood one night when we was going up to the prayer meeting, um, the man said, Nice up the night, boy. And I said, Man looks at the inward. <laughs> or God looks at my heart. You know? <laughs> so God knew why I wasn't wearing it. It was humiliated. Um, but in 2021, Derek um, sent me a text. And they'd been praying for me in, in their church. And Derek and his wife, Jillian, um, he said the Lord had put me on their hearts and I always let do you, know, do you ever invite someone to church and they never come and they say they're coming and, but I always let Derek down Derek was a good man but this night he said that he knew I would come I'd no sit by the way <laughs> but um, this night I went to Sandown Road Free Presbyterian um, Church and um, I, found, I found it hard to go because I was mixed up in a lot of things and it, it wasn't good but um, when I walked in, you know, you know, it's not like here, but the organ was going and they were singing, and it was lovely too. They were singing, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Reaching to the farthest soul away. Well, I got my answer. I knew the farthest soul away was me. And even at the baptism, Taddy spoke on that theme, you know, and that reassured me that, that someone like me, that God 
can reach and God's still reaching men and women today. Um, I don't have a clue what the preacher said that night but God spoke to me you see because I watched the sermon by the old man again broken things and he said and Alicia and you can read it yourself at home um, and Alicia in 1st Kings chapter 20 had a ply and it broke I'm trying to teach my kids this stop bringing me the broken things and fix them yourself but Elijah didn't fix the ply and, and, and Pastor Jim McConnell said the broken ply represents a total break with the old life with the old ways and Alicia didn't fix it do you know what he done? he burned it and what God was saying to me was burn your bridges with your old ways uh, no more cocaine no more loyalism no more whatever you do you know um, a total break make the break make the grade with God and that's exactly what the old pastor said and do you know what happened next all my problems went away and everything was great I'm not, they did not, I'm joking <laughs> um, the problems didn't go away at all quite the opposite that's when I knew there was a devil <laughs> that's when I knew that's when I knew there was a devil not many days after that I think it might have been 10 days we'll have to look back but it's not all that important um, the time but um, a couple of weeks after that I just finished a Bible study and I still have the page and I signed it at the end it was on God's love but um, I got a phone call from a friend and he rang to tell me that the brigade in North Down um, had expelled me um, from playing football, if you want to call it that. And I had, um, I had 24 hours to leave and uh, this is what I left with was my Bible. I left with my Bible because, you see, when I was in Sandown Road that night, God spoke to me. I didn't hear a voice, but he spoke to me through broken things. And I knew something was going to happen. And I knew God would do it his way. And I knew God had to do something to get me away from cocaine. Or I would be in a body bag. Um, so I left with my Bible. And that's how God was going to do it. And I didn't know how I would survive being homeless or being alone. I didn't even have any identification. You know. Um, I didn't ask for help. Um, some days it was hard, it was coming in to the winter time. But to say when you hit rock bottom, that's when you realise that Christ is the rock. Um, didn't ask for help. And um, my mum helped me a wee bit, but apart from that, that was it. And one day on the Woodstock Road, there was a load of bins. It's just across from the library, but you'll see a wall, and it says on the wall, Hope is an anchor. Well, behind that wall... Um, a few weeks before, I'd left my phone number in, you know, if you need a hand or anything. Um, this guy rang me, and he said to me, um, come and see him. And he says, where are you staying at? And in the sign, you know, that way it says, I said, Ravenhill, for it said Ravenhill in the sign. So um, when I went to see Keith um, in the kitchen, I started helping in the kitchen. And I started helping with deliveries, and every night, um, you got a free meal. But... More importantly, God was putting my broken pieces back together. Before I had left, I had three houses. I had sports cars. I had money. I had everything. Um, but God was putting my broken pieces um, back together. In the next six months, um, I was arrested twice by the police. Um, one of those times I was in hospital. And the doctor, um, his religion wasn't Christianity. And... Uh, um, they, they give me my notes to take home and give to my GP. When I give the notes to my GP, he said, you have to put them in the post box. You're not meant to have them. He's give you the, they shouldn't have given you those notes. But the police raided my home for those notes, which I held them to account for. Um, another time, they raided my house during the Loyalist feud here in North Down, with seeing me coming and going, picking up the children. Um, I forgot to pay for a tenner of petrol. And um, was it... 68 days after forgetting to pay for a tenner of petrol, um, the police come and search my house during the Loyalist feud. And I said to the police officer, there's not even a cigarette but only a Bible. And I said, there's nothing, there's no guns, there's no drugs, there's nothing. And that's the change uh, that Jesus makes in a life. Um, not long after, um, I got to stay in a wee apartment in Hillsborough for a while. 
And uh, I got soon then offered a lovely house in a place called Victor Place. Um, I know people and they say, you maybe hear it too, the Lord got me this here and then the next thing you see it for sale or, or they're on the, the swap, trying to get it swapped. But the Lord got me this wee Victor Place and it was an answer to prayer. And you see, because I had read and someone wrote an article about Victor Place and it says, one day every Christian will live in Victor Place and you can write over heaven, Victor Place. In the book of Revelation, John writes, what the Lord shows him to say, Jesus refers to the victor, those who believed in him and those who are saved and trusting in his wonderful salvation. And there in Victor Place, um, God put me back together his way. There was plenty of ups and downs. And even today, like, uh, I think it was yesterday, Caleb said to me, Daddy, I want to go back to the old house. Because people came to Victor Place and they would say, uh, they, they come in here, they felt the presence of God in the wee house and the Bible says a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions it's not what you have but it's who and it doesn't matter if you don't have anything if you have the Lord you've more than you ever um, need it um, after this happened to me um, the biggest problem I had was I had to fight a corrupt uh, would you call it judicial but I had to fight to get to see my children um, December 2022, after fighting for my children, who I love very much for 18 months, um, with no movement from court, God told me to get my house ready. So I went into B&M and the paint was on offer for a tenner. And I knew, so I bought all this paint and got everything ready and all. And then um, I, had a, I had a phone call from the barrister and the solicitor, like a meeting, and they said, um, You've only, all you can hope for is a weekly phone call. And uh, I was absolutely got it. And I told them, no, no, God's promise. Because Mr. McElveen and Mr. Wilson both spoke on the same text. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And a few weeks later, I brought my children home. Because God had promised. Um, I've taken all... Um, I've, um, I've taken all Taddy's time and I'm going to have to finish. Um, I met Laura and uh, we all came together, as you know, um, as one family. And I would never go back. I would never change what I have found in the Lord. I would, you know, would never give it away for anything. Just to say as closing, I'm sorry I've taken all your time, Taddy, but you'll get over it. <laughs> sorry, no, but um, Taddy once told me he would never give up on me. And there's no hopeless cases with God's grace. In three years, I've made many mistakes. I've done things that I'd have been better not doing. I've left things undone that I ought to have done, and other things I could have done a lot better. But I'm glad God is patient with me, and he's kept me, and he's taught me from my mistakes, because God delights in broken things. Thank you for listening. I'll not keep you long, even though Sam took all my time. No, let me tell you, Sam, that was absolutely brilliant. No, listen, that, honestly, that was absolutely brilliant. And uh, the whole lot of the things that he hasn't told you, maybe you can ask him yourself sometime. Uh, just some of the incredible things that God has done in his life. And it's just wonderful, wonderful to know that our God is a faithful God. You know, way back from the 6A days when we were out doing the outreach and we bumped into Sam, I think he came the next week to speak to me, but I was away somewhere else and I didn't see him for years. And then I'd got wind that there was the problem down your neck of the woods and, um, and the, the team were asking you to slide on. Um, and, and I was pointing Sam and saying to Sam, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. And look what Jesus has done. Incredible. And our God is a faithful God. So very, very quickly, thank you, Sam, uh, for your testimony. I'm only going to be a few minutes here. But in Sam's testimony tonight, he spoke about Psalm 51. He mentioned a whole lot of other scriptures, but Psalm 51 uh, and what that meant to him. And the whole thing about that song, the Psalms are songs. The whole thing about Psalm 51 
It gives us some insight into the heart of King David of Israel, who knew that he had greatly sinned against God. Now Sam knew, Sam knew that he had sinned against God. The question that we have here in life is, you know, do we look at the wrong in our life, about wrong that we have done to other people, and forget to understand that we wrong first and foremost a holy God? That is who we have wronged. And so King David in Psalm 51 is writing about recognizing that he had done wrong. And so let me give you an example of what he had done. He had committed adultery with the wife of one of his soldiers, a guy called Uriah. He had committed adultery with Uriah's wife. And then when Bathsheba came and says to him, guess what, I'm pregnant, what are we going to do? King David then tried to manipulate Uriah in such a way that he would go and sleep with his wife, hoping that then he would think the baby was his. And when that failed, David intentionally arranged for Uriah to be killed in a battle. And then David took Uriah's wife Bathsheba as his. But God saw what happened and he sent the prophet Nathan to confront David about what he had done. And even though David confessed and genuinely confessed, and you read Psalm 51, this is David's confession of what he had done. Even though he confessed to God for his sin, the baby died. And we've got to understand, Christians, that sometimes when we're out there committing sins, and we think, oh, sure, God doesn't see, or it's not going to cause anybody any harm. There is always, always a consequence for sin. David was an adulterer. He was a deceiver. He was a murderer. Can God forgive someone guilty of such wickedness? Can God forgive adulterers who destroy marriages and destroy families? Can God forgive deceivers? Can he forgive murderers? Can God forgive someone guilty of such wickedness? Well, the answer is yes. And Sam mentioned in Psalm 130, he was talking about verse 1. Out of the depth I cried to God. But it says in verses 3 and 4, If you, Lord, if you were to mark our, our, our iniquities, if you should mark our iniquities, our sins, O oh Lord, who among us could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Do you hear what, the, what King David is telling, what the psalmist is telling us here, what David is telling us in Psalm 51, that as, a, as a, an adulterer, as a deceiver, as a, a murderer, he knew that there was forgiveness with God. And the other psalmist tells us that if God is to mark our, our sins and hold them against us, there's not a person on planet earth who could stand before a holy God because we are all sinners. But then he tells us, but there is forgiveness with, with God. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. You see, the Bible teaches that we are all sinners. We may not have all murdered, we may not have all been adulterers, but we are all sinners before a holy God. We are all guilty of sin against God and we all deserve to die and to be cast into hell. That is what we deserve. That is what a holy God says. But there is forgiveness with God. Because of Jesus, the sinless Son of God who loves us, who came into this world and died in our place to pay the price for our sin. Because of Jesus, there is forgiveness for whosoever wants it. God, can God forgive, can God forgive us, <clears throat> pardon me, for the wickedness of our sin? See, I don't know your sin tonight. You know your sin. You may know even just some of your sin. God knows all of your sin. Every sin that you have committed from day one to this very night. He knows every sin that you have committed. He knows everything about you. You can't hide your sin from God. Can God forgive us for the wickedness of our sins? Psalm 51 verse 17, the psalm says, The sacrifices of God 
or a broken spirit. What it's saying is what God is looking for is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. He's looking for the broken things. He's looking for those people who recognize that they are broken, who recognize that they are sinners, that sin has broken them, and they want God wants them to come to him and say, I'm broke. I am broken because of sin. Can you help me? And that is what God is looking for. God says, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, these, O oh God, you will not despise. You see, this speaks of someone who realizes that they've done wrong and they admit it. They don't try, as Sam and I were talking during the week, they don't try and pass the buck or put the blame on others. They admit that it is their sin that they have sinned against the Holy God. They admit to God that it is him that they have sinned against. And it speaks of someone here, it speaks of someone who is deeply grieved, sorrowful, sorry for what they've done. And in their sorrow, they turn to God seeking forgiveness. The Bible says, please listen tonight here in the hall and those on Facebook and on YouTube. The Bible says it doesn't matter what sins you have committed. It doesn't matter how grievous those sins may be. It doesn't matter how vile your sin may be. Bible says clearly that there is forgiveness with God for all who acknowledge their sin and are sorry for it and humbly come to him by faith in Jesus, believing that Jesus has paid the debt for your sin. Billy Graham, the late American evangelist, said these words, God's forgiveness is not just a casual statement. It is the complete blotting out of all dirt and degradation of sin, past, present and future. This is what God is offering tonight. He is saying if you come to me acknowledging your sin and asking for forgiveness, I will blot it out forever. Past, present and future sins will be removed forever. That is what God is saying. But just as God's forgiveness is not just a casual statement that some preacher rhymes off, neither should our confession of sin be merely a casual statement. There is forgiveness for sin for you tonight, if you want it. David sinned. He knew what he had done. David sinned and God saw God saw David's sin and he said, Nathan, God has seen your sin. He knows all of your sin tonight and still his arms are outstretched, open wide to receive you and to give you forgiveness if you will come to him tonight. David confessed his sin. He agreed. You read Psalm, 1, Psalm 51. You will not find him saying, oh, I'm so sorry that I slept with Uriah's wife. I'm so sorry that I murdered Uriah. He's not saying that. He is confessing. He is agreeing with God. You have said that I am a sinner. And you are right. I am a sinner. So David confesses his sin. He is deeply sorry for his sin against God. And what happens is God forgives him. Well, it's that simple for you tonight. Here in the hall... Or are you watching in on Facebook or on YouTube? Doesn't matter what you have done. God already knows. But what he's saying is, come to me. Come to me and admit it. That you have sinned against me. Come to me through Jesus Christ, my son. Trust that he has paid the debt for your sin in full. Come to me tonight. Because God is telling you there is forgiveness for sin for you tonight if you will come to God. Just like Sam came to God. He came to that point where he confessed his sin and God graciously saved him. And he's now walking with the Lord and God has a wonderful plan still for his life. And you know what? Tonight God has a plan for you. But do you want to walk in it? Or do you want to walk away from it? Choice is yours. There's forgiveness 
for you tonight with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Sam's testimony tonight. We want to thank you for the wonderful way that you have saved him by your grace through faith in Jesus. We want to thank you, Lord God, that it is a journey that he's on and he's going to make mistakes like the rest of us. And yet, nonetheless, Lord God, he keeps looking on to you. He keeps looking on to the one who is altogether beautiful. And he asks you, O oh God, to guide him and to lead him. Father, tonight we thank you for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is forgiveness with God for anyone, anyone who will come to you tonight and humbly confess their sins and ask you for forgiveness. And through faith in Jesus Christ, your son, they shall receive that forgiveness. They shall receive everlasting life. They shall be adopted into your family. And you promise in your word that their sin, past, present, and future, will be blotted out. Lord, may people tonight avail of that wonderful promise and come to you and receive salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen.